Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do is I want to look at a problem, a uh, hydraulics problem that we solve using Pascal's principle. All right, so we're first going to review what Pascal's principle is, and then we're going to show you how to solve a problem where you have a tube like this that's uh, filled with water or uh, some incompressible fluid. And typically what you do is you apply a force on one end, and then you see what happens at the other end. And you can use a hydraulic system like the one I've depicted here to lift really heavy objects with only applying a small force. That's a lot less than the weight of the object that you're trying to lift. So so we're going to view the important equations that you need to know for hydraulic systems that apply Pascal's principle. And um, then we're going to solve a problem. Let's solve an actual numerical problem where I'm going to give you the force and the dimensions of that cylinder and we're going to calculate a bunch of stuff. All right, we're going to look at the work. We're going to look at the mechanical advantage, the pressure on both sides of this hydraulic system. All right, like with all my videos, if you like them, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel if you like what I do. Leave a comment down below. I'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. All right, let's get started. All right, so first let's define what Pascal's principle is. Um, Pascal's principle, and we're gonna highlight just the, some of the terms here, it basically says that if you have a pressure change applied to a, a contained fluid, like the one I have shown here, it's contained by both of these pistons, a small one on the left and a bigger one on the right-hand side, um, that pressure change is transmitted undiminished, okay, at every point in the fluid and also to the walls of the container. All right, so let's see how we can produce a pressure change. Well, one thing we could do is we could apply a force to this side of um, our hydraulic system, right? Now, if you imagine that um, this is a circular piston over here, it's going to have a cross section, uh, which is going to have a certain area. We're gonna label that A1. Now, what are you gonna get on the other side? Now, the reason you want a hydraulic system, first of all, what it does really is it changes the direction of the force. So you push down on this side, guess what? You're going to have a resulting force pushing up on the other side. Now, what we wanna do really is kind of connect both of those forces, right? What happens if I push down with 10 newtons on this side? What do I get on the other side? Now, we're gonna see in a second that, again, this side has a larger piston, right? We're gonna say that it has a cross-sectional area A2, and in this case, clearly A2 is bigger than A1. Well, Pascal's principle says that this pressure is undiminished. So if I calculate the pressure uh, on the left-hand side, it must be equal to the pressure on the right-hand side. All right, that change in pressure is undiminished. Now, if you remember the definition of pressure, well, let's apply it over here uh, on the left-hand side. It's that perpendicular force acting on the fluid divided by that cross-sectional area. And if I do the same thing on the other side now, well, what am I doing? I'm gonna get that force F2 over a different cross-section. Now, the key to Pascal's principle and to understand, and understand hydraulic systems is to rewrite this equation. Remember, F2 is kind of my output force. If I bring this area A2 on the other side, I'm gonna open up a bracket here, A2 over A1, and I still have my original force that I'm applying here on the left-hand side. Now, one thing you could see is that if we have a bigger area, A2, what you're gonna end up doing over here is you're gonna get a larger force, right? F2 is going to be bigger than F1 as long as this ratio is bigger than one. Okay, so that is really the key over here to Pascal's principle is applying this guy and we're able to get this equation because We've set the pressure change to be undiminished throughout this entire fluid. All right, now let's go and apply this equation and see what happens for a numerical example. All right, so here's the problem I want to solve. We have um, a large piston in a hydraulic lift system here. This one here has a radius of 20 centimeters. Uh, let me go ahead and write that on the diagram. That's this distance over here. And if I write away, if I write it as 0 0.2 meters, Okay, uh, they want to know what force must I apply to the small piston? Uh, so we're really looking for this guy here, F1. Uh, and the radius of this guy is a lot smaller, right? This is R1, which is only 2 centimeters, so 0 0.02 meters, okay? Uh, 10 times smaller than uh, this guy. And what we're also given is the mass of the car is 1,500 
kilograms. All right, so the way to start this, I think I would do a free body diagram, right? For example, if you do it on the car or on the piston, again, you're going to have the weight of the car acting down, right? That's simply 1,500 times 9.8. And what you want is this force F2 um, from the piston pushing up on the car to be at least equal to the weight, right? So let's go ahead and write that first equation. If we have F2 equals to mg, uh, we're going to at least be in equilibrium. And if the force is any bigger, then that'll be okay. We can go ahead and calculate that magnitude, right? Because this is simply 1,500. And little g, we're just going to take 9.8. So I go ahead and I put everything in my calculator. And what do I get? Lo and behold, I get uh, 14,700 newtons. So this is really the force that I want. But what I'm really asking for is what is the force on the small piston? Okay, so for that, really what we're going to do is we're going to use Pascal's principle because, again, the pressure is uniform everywhere. We think about how would I write um, pressure and forces uh, in our equation, right? Remember, we always have this relationship that the pressure is the force over the area. And it doesn't matter which side I write that on because the pressure is the same everywhere, okay? That pressure increase is going to be the same. So let's play around with our first equation over here. Uh, instead of writing F2, well, F2, I can write that as the pressure multiplied by the area, A2. And one more step now, really what I can do now is I can introduce the variable F1 by eliminating the pressure right here. So I'm gonna do that. So we're gonna have F1 over A1 multiplied by A2. And that here has to be equal to mg, this 14,700 newtons. What we're going to do now is simply rearrange this formula. So let's go ahead and do that right here. So we're going to have F1. Now if I swap the areas on the other side, it looks like this. It's A1 over A2. Okay, and now it's still multiplied by mg. All right, now the last step here is just to substitute in the formulas for the area. And basically what we're doing here is we assume that they are circular cross sections. So the area of uh, this cylinder over here, the small one, is pi r1 squared. And this one here is pi r2 squared. I know the radii of each one of those. All right, so I've rearranged the formula. Now you can cancel out things that are common. And at the end, all we have to do now is substitute our numbers. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that. So we're going to have 0 0.02 squared over 0 0.2 squared. Be careful here. Uh, multiplied by mg. mg we've already calculated, but let me just go ahead and just write all the terms. 1,509.8. Okay, put everything in the calculator, and guess what? F1 is going to end up being 147 newtons. All right, so let me box that up. That's an important result. Now, when you're dealing with these hydraulic systems, so sometimes you're asked to calculate the force, uh, forces on each side, and that's okay. That's what we just did here. The other term that often comes up is something called the mechanical advantage. So I want to go first look at that, and then we're also going to look at what happens in terms of the energy or in terms of the work when I push this piston down in order to raise the car. So let's do that after. All right, oftentimes when we're dealing with uh, systems like this where you have an input on one side and we have an output on the other side, a definition comes up in terms of what is called the mechanical advantage. And sometimes you just use the letter MA for this. Okay? Uh, the mechanical advantage for any system uh, is equal to our output force over our input force. Okay, and for this system over here. Our output force is the force F2, and our input was the force F1. Now, I know the magnitude of both of those. I just calculated them. All right, if you actually do this, you're going to get a factor of 100. So you'd simply say that the mechanical advantage for this hydraulic system is 100. And it's just the number because it's the ratio of two forces. Now, again, why is it 100? Well, again, um, that's because of the different size of the pistons, right? So we have F2 is equal to 100 times the force F1. And this is simply because the area A2 was 100 times larger than the area A1. <laughs> and that is because of the different size of the pistons. Uh, the radius R2 of the large piston 
is 10 times the radius r1. And since the area is equal to pi r squared, it ends up being a factor of 100 for the area, which translates into a factor of 100 for the forces. Okay, but this is just a definition that often comes up for hydraulic systems or lift systems, and it's simply the output over the input. Now, it may seem like we're getting something for nothing, right? We only put in 147 newtons of force, but we're getting in, we're getting out rather, 14,700 newtons on the large piston. Does not doesn't that bother you a little bit? Doesn't it violate conservation of energy? So for this next problem, what I want to do is I want to look at the work done. Really what I want to do with this car is I typically want to raise it a certain height, right? Maybe Y2. And I do that by pushing down on the piston a certain distance. Maybe call it Y1. So let's go have a look at what's going on when I try to lift something and look at the work involved. All right, for the last problem here, I want to consider a case now. What if I wanted to lift this car and I want to lift it a height of 0.3 meters? So that would be kind of this guy on this side, okay? 30 centimeters roughly. How much work is required to lift the car? Well, if you remember uh, from physics class how you define work, in this case, I have a force pointing up and I also have a displacement pointing up. So I can simply write the work as being F2 multiplied by that displacement, okay? And this is a straightforward calculation, uh, 14,700. Oops, let's keep the units out for now. Uh, multiplied by 0 0.3, and the amount of energy that it costs me in order to do this is what I call the work, and I think I get like 4,410 joules. Okay, that is the required work in order to lift that car 30 centimeters. Now, one thing to consider about this is, again, if you're lifting this up, remember what you're doing here is you're moving some fluid up 30 centimeters, right? So you're going to take all of this volume and, right, you have to move it up. But if you think about it, whatever volume I'm moving up has to be the same volume that gets kind of displaced over on the small piston side. Right, so it's kind of like the volume on one side must equal to the volume on the other side. So, well, let's go see. How do you calculate the volume for a circular cross-section cylinder? It's just the area multiplied by the height, right? So it's kind of like how far do I have to push down on this side? So this is going to go into the volume calculation. It has to be equal to the area A2 multiplied by the displacement on this side, right? The same volume of fluid because it's confined to this hydraulic system. Actually, if you look at what is the displacement on the small cylinder side, that's this guy. Ah, you see what happens over here. And this is a very, very important result is you get our relationship over here. So if I start substituting our numbers, Okay, again, remember this ratio of the areas for these two cylinders was our mechanical advantage. That was 100 and times the displacement that we want on this side. So in order to get uh, 30 centimeters or 0.3 meters on one side, what you have to do on the other side is you need a displacement that is 100 times bigger. And if you go ahead and you actually calculate the work on this side, okay, you'll see that whatever energy you put in is the same energy you're going to get out. In this case, I would do uh, F1 multiplied by displacement Y1. Well, that force was 147 newtons. And if I multiply that by 100 and multiplied by Y2, which is what I have right here, guess what I'm going to get? I'm going to get the exact same result that I have over here. So we do have the same amount of work that is required. It doesn't matter which side you actually look at the equation, okay, for work, you're going to get the same value. The advantage of using a hydraulic system comes in right over here because I can do it with a much smaller force, but that force must be applied over a much greater distance. Right? On the other side, on the large cylinder side, I have a very large force and it's applied over a much smaller distance. But at the end of the day, the work is the same. All right, folks, thanks for watching. Hopefully this helps you and helps clarify some of the questions that you might have had with Pascal's principle. Thanks for watching.